Namaste, and welcome to another episode of Yoga Vasishta. We're still in the middle of Rama's speech about the causes of his depression, and they are legion. <laughs> Basically, everything that we think is so great and wonderful, Rama sees as a source of trouble. So today, he's talking about wealth. And uh, let's tune in to the conversation. O oh, sage, here wealth is reckoned a blessing, yet she is the cause of our troubles and errors. She bears away our peace like a river in the rainy season. All high-spirited simpletons are overpowered by her current. Her daughters are anxieties, fostered by many a bad deed, like the waves of a stream raised by winds. She can never stand steady on her legs anywhere, but like a wretched woman who has burnt her feet, she limps from one place to another. Wealth is like a lamp that both burns and blackens its owner until extinguished by its own flame. She is unapproachable like princes and fools and likewise as favorable as they to her adherents, without scanning their merits or faults. She begets only evils in them by their various acts, as good milk, when given to serpents, serves to increase the strength of their poison. Now, Rama is really getting to the core of the human condition, and the false and actually evil incentives that drive bad actions in society. And we've all heard stories of people going to Silicon Valley and getting rich. Huh? But if we knew the cloak and dagger skullduggery behind those richness stories, maybe they wouldn't seem so attractive. I'll tell you my own story. I was working with Gary Kildall, who was the author of CPM, which was one of the early operating systems for the PC. And while I was working for him, I noticed something very strange. That suddenly his company, which had been a bunch of cool, nerdy outsiders, was suddenly being taken over by suits. And these people were like fundamentalist Christian types, and they stuck together like glue. So as time went by, the original members of the company became more and more uh, outsiders. And these uh, suits wormed their way into p positions of influence. But then a story started going around that IBM had come to meet with Kildall about using CPM as the operating system for the IBM PC. Now, of course, this would have been a huge deal, it would have made the company 10 times as prosperous or 100 times. In fact, it would have become like Microsoft. Now, why did Microsoft get the deal instead of CPM? Because Gary Kildall, as the story, the rumor had it, was high on cocaine, flying his plane. <laughs> he had a private plane, just a Cessna. So he didn't want to come down and meet with the IBM suits. And so he lost the deal. That's the story anyway. Well, after that, things got pretty rocky at uh, the company. Kildall's company, I left and I went to do other things. And then I heard the story about six months later that he died under mysterious circumstances at a bar. And so I always wondered, you know, was he offed or what, you know? Anyway, so all of these big Silicon Valley companies, all these big wealthy people, they all have some dark past. Uh, they all have skeletons in the closet. 
No one becomes rich by being a holy man. No one gets a fortune by acting nicely and being fair. As my Adi Guru Prabhupada used to say, business means cheating. And of course, cheating is against morality. It's against truth. It's against good behavior. So why are these guys cheating? To get rich. See, like he says, wealth is reckoned a blessing, but it's actually the cause of our bad behavior. All our errors and troubles come from this struggle for money. In today's society, money equals power. If you have enough money, you can get whatever you want. And so driven by money and ego, people do horrible things, terrible things that they regret later. And in their old age, they're troubled by facing death, knowing their shady activities in the past. So in other words, wealth is not something very desirable. Huh? You can't hold on to it. As soon as you get it, then you have to struggle to keep it. Somebody's always trying to cheat you out of it. And it just leads to so many anxieties. It's better not to have it. It's better to be a little poor than too much wealthy. I have experience with this myself. So I know. Now I have just barely enough to live on and it's perfect. <laughs> I'm comfortable, but not flush with money. So there's no temptation to go and spend it on something stupid. <laughs> I'm very happy like this. A rich man without blemish, a brave man devoid of vanity, and a master lacking partiality are the three rarities on earth. The rich are as inaccessible as the dark cave of a huge serpent and as unapproachable as the deep wilderness of Vindhya Mountain inhabited by fierce elephants. Riches, like the shadow of night, overcast the good qualities of men and, like moonlight, bring to bloom the buds of their misery. Like a hurricane, they blow away the brightness of a fair prospect Riches resemble a sea with huge surges. They bring a cloud of fear and error upon us, increase the poison of despondence and regret, and are like dreadful snakes in the field of our choice. Rama knew he was very wealthy. He was the scion of probably the wealthiest family in India at the time. So he knew about wealth and all the intrigue and backstabbing that goes on behind the scenes. What people will do to get wealth, there's no limit. They'll kill, steal, lie, cheat, do anything to get wealth. So it's better to put aside this desire for wealth. It's better to learn to be satisfied with little. Whatever comes with no effort, is the best income. Now, a lot of people are going to say, but how will we live? Huh? Because you're in a society that worships wealth. You're in a society that measures the value of a human life by the amount of wealth. And that, I'm going to tell you right now, is sick. So you're living in a sick society. The best thing to do is get out of it. Go to another culture. Go to a place where things are cheaper. And if you have a fixed income like I do, a pension income, then just make do with what you have. You know, if you withdraw from society for meditation, which is highly advisable, uh, once you have a bona fide guru, it doesn't matter where you live. Uh, it doesn't matter what condition you live in, as long as you can concentrate and meditate and do your sadhana. That's really the important thing in life. I see no joy in uncivil prosperity, which is full of treachery and replete with every kind of danger and trouble. 
It is a pity that prosperity is like a shameless wench who will again lay hold of a man who has abandoned her for her rival, poverty. What is she with all her loveliness and attraction of human hearts, but a momentary thing obtained by all manner of evil means and resembling at best a flower shrub growing out of a cave inhabited by a snake and beset by reptiles all about its stem. Ooh, Rama. <laughs> well, wait till we get to the chapter on women. <laughs> Rama is down on everything because he has seen with tremendous clarity how the incentives of wealth, fame, property, enjoyment, and so on, drive us to do all sorts of things that ruin our future. Our future means our next life. And as we've discussed here so many times, at the end of life, one's whole life passes before one's mind's eye. And so whatever we have done, whatever we have thought, whatever our emotions have been throughout our life, passes before the mind's eye at the time of death and determines the state of being that we achieve in the next life. Yam yang vapi smaran bhavam tyajatante kalevaram tang tang evaiti konteya sadatat bhava bhavitaha. The famous verse in Bhagavad Gita. It means exactly that. Whatever you think at the time of death, determines the state of being of your next life. So in that way, if your life has been full of intrigue and nasty cheating business, huh, you're going to remember that at the time of death and regret it because it's going to lead to a lower birth, either a very degraded human birth or even birth in the animal species. I mean, it doesn't really matter, you know, even if a person gets caught and thrown in jail for illegal business, it still doesn't erase the memory of what they did and it's going to haunt them. And at the time of death, it's going to drive them to produce a lower quality body for the next life. I'm sorry, that's just the way it is. That is the law, the law of becoming. And there's no God in the sky that punishes us. We do it to ourselves. Our own conscience tries and convicts us in the court of truth. And then death is the bailiff who enforces the sentence. So this is the way it really is. And that's why we have to be very cautious when it comes to wealth and not do anything that would cause us regret later on. That will help us when it comes to attaining self-realization. Because self-realization can only be attained by one who has no regrets, no guilt about the past at all. Aung Tat Sat. Aung Harihi Aung. Karunar Navamai Kardakadinal Aruna Chalashivam Yida